Hello again, listeners, friends and colleagues. Um, here we are, another podcast, another session and another very, very interesting character. Apart from the fact that he's an Arsenal supporter, but we'll leave that one right out of the frame. Name, Lee Lawrence. He's the Chief Investment Officer of Tarabot. He's been in the position for four and a half years and he's also had positions all over the Middle East and he was a CFO of the Sovereign Wealth Fund and he was also a seconded CEO of Airport International Group. Quite a mouthful, Lee. Yes, Chris. Okay, and as an Arsenal supporter, I know you'll have no problem responding. So, Lee, first question. Why did you agree to come on the podcast? Well, Chris, your uh, your persuasive skills are uh, uh, fantastic and you're slightly bigger than me. And uh, you, will you please put me down and I'll, I'll, I'll tell me whatever you want. Uh, I'll remember that, Lee. I'll <laughs> definitely remember that. No, but seriously, lovely to have you on board. I've had the pleasure of working with you, seeing you in action and getting to know you and all three have not only been impressive, but enjoyable. So I thank you for the time that we've had together as well. That's a pleasure. So now, firstly, how did you get into aviation? What was the what was the catalyst or the, the, the motivation? What made you come into this business? Uh, to be honest with you, um, it was not by choice um, or by design. And I think like many people, uh, career paths take uh, different routes depending on circumstances and uh and I suppose being in a certain place at a certain time, um, mine was actually driven by the the global financial crisis, 2008 and 2009, uh, where I was working in Abu Dhabi and responsible for a number of investments as part of one of the sovereign wealth funds. And one of those investments happened to be an airport, um, an extro- extremely important asset and a large-scale infrastructure project, not just for the investors, but also for the Middle East. Um, I started to take a more and more uh, enlightened interest in the nature of the development. That led to me to becoming part of the uh, the board and the executive management team. And uh, and that's uh, where they say I've got a little bit of jet fuel up my nose. Yeah. And I've been involved in airports, aviation and the infrastructure development sector around, you know, air transportation assets really ever since. And, and it, is, it is peculiar, isn't it? Most people don't sit down in a school classroom and say to themselves, I can't wait to get into cargo or aviation. It just it just happens, doesn't it? Yeah, look, and I, I think the beauty of the industry is it brings so many different classes of individual together with so many different backgrounds. Um, uh, myself, my background is that I was a banker, financier. I spent 20 years in Barclays. You were a what, sorry? Uh, yeah, a banker. Nothing to do with Arsenal again. No, no, thank you. Uh, but look, within that, I think there's a, there's a huge amount you learn in that kind of financial services industry. Of course, yeah. You know, customer service orientation, project management skills, the discipline of you know, setting up and running a, a business, whether you're doing that for yourself as part of your role or whether you're advising your clients. And airports, aviation are very customer service orientated entities. They exactly. are businesses. They, are, they need to be profitable to be able to reinvest in their infrastructure. And the kinds of disciplines of project management and change and transformation uh, I, I saw being required in the industry and I, I was able to, uh, to support that. Um, like all things, you know, there are challenges, uh, you know, in the in the industry. And uh, and I like the fact that it's ever changing. I, I'm also very fortunate that I'm in an industry that is growing very rapidly and it's dependent upon so many parties, you know, for its success. And if I can play a small role in that, then that's the legacy I'd like to leave. There you go. Uh, well spoken, eh? <laughs> Lee, would, you spoke about change. Okay, so now some of the change you're seeing at the moment, what would you say are the key areas or, or the areas of focus that we all have to be aware of? Yeah, from my point of view, I'm, uh, I'm based here in uh, Saudi Arabia and have been uh, enjoying Saudi Arabian hospitality now for the best part of five years. I have never seen so much fundamental change in, in one single organisation, the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, than I have in the last 35 years of my career. It's incredible, isn't it? Uh, the, the, the passion that the people yep. have for developing their nation um, is, is enthusiastic and it rubs off on anybody that's here. Um, now, what does that mean? What that means is that, you know, they're trying to do things that they've never done, done before in, in what we all know is a pretty, pretty difficult environment given yeah. some of the history. But it is growing very rapidly. There's 35, 38 million people that are dependent upon air transportation, not just for social and for personal reasons, but also to give the lifeblood to the country and a further diversification away from oil. 
it needs to be able to uh, move away from its predominant uh, connectivity to the oil and gas network. And actually, Saudi is a huge tourist destination. Yep. You know, I know it's tourism in, a, in maybe a way that uh, your listeners may not necessarily rec- recognize, but there are millions and millions of people every year that want to come and need to come to Saudi Arabia. Yep. And they're very keen on coming to Saudi. So aviation is that lifeblood. Airports, the infrastructure, the sectoral uh, understanding that they bring together to enable that is, is critical. And yeah. it's nice to be able to play some small role in its development. Yeah, and it is an amazing country, isn't it? I mean, likewise, I, I've been here for over five years, and uh, I've got to say, it's it's one of the most most positive and and eye opening experiences I've ever had. Yeah. And and I've got to meet some lovely, lovely people, and people who care passionately about about their country and their culture. And it's a, it's a unique experience. Uh, look, I, I, when when you're um, fortunate enough to be. Uh, at the crossroads of such a number of fundamental changes in a kingdom such as Saudi, it's 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 hard not to become infectious by the uh, the opportunity to be part of it. Now, it's not for everybody. Let's be honest. There on there are uh, elements of change and transformation that are going to be painful. Um, I think to to really take the you know the leap and the infrastructural change that are necessary, so, you know some some things need to happen that um, you know maybe more developed nations have, have tackled yeah, you yeah. know a few years ago, but I think Saudi is ready for that now. Yeah. Um, I think in terms of the way that it's tackling you know inclusiveness in terms of the workforce, um, bringing ladies into the workforce, looking at uh, more generalist entertainment options, development of some key infrastructure. And don't, let's not forget, you know, the, the focus of this is around airports, aviation, and what we're doing as individuals to help develop that sector. There's 27 airports in the kingdom, three more in development as we speak, and every single one of those needs time, money, and effort to be further developed. And, um, and then the whole ecosystem servicing best part of 100 million passengers a year is only set to re, you know, grow faster than most of its near neighbours. And, yep, that, yep. and that's a heavy responsibility on the kingdom. Uh, yep, the sleeping giant is waking up. Well, very much so, yeah. yeah. Now, um, you mentioned briefly in there about, um, about youngsters and, and, and the, the workforce. Now, one of the things that we're doing is we're trying to find out a bit more about the people behind positions, but we're also trying to make people see that this industry is a really, really good industry and it opens up so many opportunities. And, and for want of a better word, people say it's not been sexy and you know, it's not the great, the great industry that others are. But, I mean, both of us, we're very passionate about it and we, we think it's a great industry. Now, what would you say to youngsters, people who are out there now at colleges, universities, they're doing whatever degree, something to do with aviation or supply chain or whatever, what would you say to them is the reason why they should consider this industry. I think the beauty of it is, it is that it gives you opportunities in a very broad uh, career mindset. Um, and I think having flexibility of mind and I think having flexibility of approach in terms of how you're approaching your future career path is is absolutely critical. Um, the years are gone now where you can be really defined at university or college in terms of where you're going to be 20 or 30 years ahead. Yep. Um, there is no, uh, that's not the kind of individuals that are, are required in, in most, you know, fast growing organisations. If you've got a customer service orientated attitude, you've got a uh, an ability to understand what makes passengers and the people that are traveling through your airports, the people that are using your cargo facilities, um, ultimately the consumers that are using the goods that you're transporting through through your infrastructure, if you can have a perspective in terms of what you're delivering for them, put yourself in their position, then it's an exciting industry to be in. And it covers virtually every area of, uh, of economic life. If you happen to enjoy working as an analytical finance agent, there's roles for you. Yep. If you're customer service orientated, if you've got a business service acumen, if you want to be in legal or marketing, communications, digital management, every single element of that is ultimately you know, encapsulated somewhere within the uh, airport aviation uh, industry. So I think there's something for everybody. Um, and also, it gives you a great career path. There's opportunities to expand as the uh, as the as, as you develop, and uh, and ultimately and the, now and the global opportunities. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, it is a very much a global global industry. Yeah. Um, 
we need to identify new and hungry talent that are going to be the next airport managers, the next leaders of those infrastructure funds, yeah. those new or, or managing those uh, those airlines. Yeah, and look at us coming together in a place. I mean, who would have thought 10, 15, 20 years ago, two London lads would meet up in Saudi Arabia? <laughs> Absolutely. And, uh, and and let's hope there's many, many others behind us. Yeah, too. exactly. Now, uh, an- another thing especially leaders, people who inspire others. So now I'm, I'm assuming, and, and I know you have, you, you mentor, you coach, you're very generous with your, with your experience and sharing. Who in your career would you remember as being a great mentor or, or coach who helped you, gave you the leg up or an opportunity or a, or a window of, of insight? Uh, I think I can, I can think of a couple. Um, uh, but let me single out two that that uh, uh, and one was uh, one was a lady and one was a man. Um, I remember when I was uh, mum and dad will be so pleased with you, Lee. <laughs> one was a lady and one was a man, and and the lady had a profound effect on me. She was one of my first female bosses. I was twenty four, twenty five. I was yeah. in Barclays. She was a very very uh, senior individual in her time, and she taught me uh, how to make time for others. There was never an opportunity where she said to me, uh, please come and find me at five o'clock or uh, I'm not available at the moment. Please come again on Tuesday. Uh, Whenever you knocked on her door, well, in most cases, there was never a door to knock on. She was permanently available. She was always able to give you time. And she was able to very quickly empathize with your position um, and give you a, a lot of grounded advice. And to some extent, uh, it, it rubbed off on me because I think she she was able to identify characteristics and traits in me that probably nobody else had ever identified and give me a direction in where I could potentially take my role in that organization going forward, which was very helpful. Um, and ultimately it proved to be successful. The second one was when somebody said to me at one point, I think I've got enough faith and trust in you to be able to run a business that I know you've never run before, to get involved in something which is right outside your comfort zone. But Lee, you are the person to do it for me. And that's that personal uh, statement to say that, to be honest with you, I know that you don't necessarily have the experience and I'm going to support you. And I know that you don't necessarily uh, have been in this industry for 20 years, but I believe that you can galvanize people around you and you can help them lead them through this transition. And how do you say no to that? Yeah, uh, and, and do you want to name the people? Because we're doing like a Hall of Fame, so you never know who might be listening and they'd <laughs> say, do you know something? You were mentioned in such a positive way. Do you want to name name? Yeah, name the, 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 uh, the, uh, the, 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 the gentleman I refer to is actually the CEO and was the chairman of AIG. He was the CEO, Nazim Al-Qudzi, um, of uh, Invest AD. Um, a good friend and a colleague for many, many years. And, you know, and he was the one that said to me, you know, Lee, I think on behalf of the company, on behalf of us as shareholders, we really want you to help us out at this particular point uh, in the transition in this airport. And, um, and, uh, and still to this day, you know, I, uh, I still very, very respect the trust and the faith that he and the fellow board members gave in me. Yeah, and what a lovely, I mean, what a lovely thing to do. I mean, obviously they don't do it lightly, but it's a great thing when people give you that confidence and or, or they have confidence in you and they give you that opportunity. Yeah. And you even, I mean, personally, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same, you, you try harder as well. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's, it's uh, opportunities to do something out of the box and to do something differently don't come along very often. Yeah. In fact, it's very easy to continue with the status quo. It's very easy to yeah, say yeah. no, to and be honest with you. Don't take a chance, no very, risk. Very, yeah, very easy to say, no, 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 I, I'm, I'm prepared to stay in my home nation. I'm not prepared to travel abroad. It's very easy yeah. to say, actually, it's destabilizing or, de- or, or unsettling. Uh, it's very easy to say, do you know what? I don't think this is right for me at this time. It's harder to say yes. It's, uh, but if there's one thing I can definitely uh, uh, give testament to, it's far more enjoyable to say yes and then try and work through the challenges you'll get a lot more personal satisfaction out of it. And hey, you will learn something that you never learned before. 100%. And, and sometimes it's, it's not necessarily the most easiest thing to do to move into a very uncomfortable position. Take on responsibility for, for a project or an infrastructure or a company or a business or even a small team when actually you're outside your comfort zone, you've never done it before. And maybe the people that maybe not even speak your own language. Um, the the organisation that that I led in Jordan, ninety nine percent of the people in that 
company spoke Arabic, and I, and I don't speak Arabic. Um, I only wish I could. Um, and to be able to try and find a way to encourage and motivate people who do not speak your, your own home language is, can be a challenge as well. Well, I'm sure you gave it a good shot, Lee. I'm sure you <laughs> well, did. Well, for the short time I was there, I, I'm sure, uh, mate. Uh, I certainly did. And for me, the people of Jordan and the, the people that work in that organisation are very close to my heart. Yeah, and 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 like you said, to, to to be given the opportunity to travel around the world as as often as as often as we have. I mean, the world isn't getting any bigger; it gets it gets smaller as you get older. So you've got to try it out. I think everybody should always be brave enough to give it a go. And it's far better to to regret what you've done than regret what you haven't done. Ah, the world is globalizing. I think you know to 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 use a hackneyed uh, phrase, and I think employers today are expecting I think their talented yeah, exactly. uh, individuals to have exposed themselves to broader economies to understand east and west to understand yep. what's driving the future of their industry going forward. Um, and increasingly, uh, individuals that are listening to this podcast will find that in a competitive environment, there will be individuals that will be going for jobs or looking for promotions that maybe have that experience. So seek every opportunity you can. Never say no. Always that's say it. yes. Why not? And, and put your hand up for the next thing that's available. You never know. You might learn something along the way. Exactly, exactly. Especially which football team to support. Ah, uh, look, you know, my passions for Arsenal know, run, know, run know, very know, deep, know, you know, Chris. I know, I know where you've been and followed them and everything <laughs> else. Um, Lee, another thing now, to get where you have and to have had the experiences that you've had, you must have made a few mistakes as well. And uh, I'm a firm believer that the best people to, to rely on or the best people to refer to are people who've made a mistake, learned from it, and really, really, really set their targets higher than when they were where they made the mistake. Any mistakes you've ever made that you've really learnt from? Um, oh, yeah, you do put me on the spot. Um, I'm sure my wife would give you probably many examples. Look, in all, in all truthfulness, uh, when I look back, there are some th there are some uh, things that, in hindsight, of course, you would have liked to have been able to have done differently. Yeah, yeah, um, all of us. Yep. There are there are uh, I wouldn't say mistakes because. Look, you've got to stand accountable at some point for where you believe that you took the right decision at the right time, uh, even if fundamentally you find that uh, you know situations come about that may not necessarily have uh, you know been in your control. Yep. Um, I look. I, I'm. I, I can think of probably a couple of uh, a couple of occasions in my life when probably I did say no. Um, when I thought it was probably in the right interests to avoid a set of circumstances or not, not take yeah. a particular role, where if I actually think back now, I would probably say I regretted it. Um, and because I thought I was doing the right thing for me at the time or the right thing for my family. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I looked to see the success that others had around if I had continued to be a part of that particular project or part of that business. But I'd, I can't say I feel I'm in regret of it, and I certainly don't consider it to be a weakness or a um, or a mistake. I think, in reality, I think uh, uh, whenever I've had an opportunity, I think to do something that's been slightly uncomfortable or out of the box, I think invariably I've probably taken it. Maybe I've uh, exposed myself to too many risks in doing so, um, and in doing so, you probably because you're not familiar necessarily with the territory, you may approach things differently, maybe be a little bit unsubtle, maybe be a little bit blunt, or um, as uh, as you probably find yourself hearing in the Middle East, there's a different tempo uh, or a different way of doing things in this part of the world, where if you've been very UK or London or New York or Western yeah, yeah, business-centric, yeah. you find that sometimes the the subtlety of doing things in a, in a far more... Uh, um, environment where collegiate uh, orientated working is absolutely critical, you find that they don't necessarily want to run to a solution. Um, and sometimes in your keenness to try and get things done, you can be sometimes a bit more heavy handed than maybe the culture or the sensitivities of the people around you would probably warrant. Uh, but look, you learn and you understand that everybody has a different way of doing things and hopefully you address that the next time you get around to it. Yep, true enough, true enough. Now, you brought your wife into it, so I'm going to capitalise on that. <laughs> if, I was to, if I was to have a chat with her and we were out for dinner and you had to go to the boys' room or, or pay for the bill and I said to her, what would you like to change in Lee? What would she say? Uh, I'd like to see him more often. 
Yes, uh, that's a common one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and then she'd say, "I'm actually quite happily seeing him less often." Um, you know, I, uh, my wife, I hopefully will take the opportunity to listen to this one day. So let me uh, start by saying that she's an absolutely amazing woman, um, and she puts up with me. Um, but she puts up with me because I have a passion for what I do. And she absolutely knows that my passion for what I do and the ability that I have to change the environment that I work in, unfortunately, takes me away from home. Yep. And it takes me away from home often enough, you know, that she gets the benefit of peace and quiet and tranquility. Uh, and then when I am around, uh, I'm a bit of a whirling dervish trying to trying to uh, organize the house and the household, you know, uh, uh, to make up for the time that I'm not around. Look, the beauty of this industry is we get to travel uh, and we get to work in places that are far and uh, yeah, uh, yeah, far yeah. and flung. I've been very fortunate that my family and I enjoyed, you know, 10 beautiful years together in Abu Dhabi as a family. They're a bit grown up now. They're back in the UK for schooling, doing fantastically well, really enjoyed their experience in the Middle East. Will always be able to call themselves global citizens and have a really good understanding of the Middle East. Um and my passion is still very much about, you know, being here and supporting, you know, these these fine organisations that we work in. So she'd probably say to me, look, Lee, you know, thanks for coming and popping in and saying hello, but quite quite happy to see you back on the plane to, to where she knows I'm uh, I'm useful and uh, and um, probably serving a greater purpose. Oh, yeah. But I, and one of the things that all of us who, who, who are in the same boat, we should pay more attention to the partners that keep everything going and they run our businesses for us at home while, whilst we're away. Absolutely. So Absolutely. Uh, I we, think to we, all the ladies out there, we can't we can't uh, do it without them. Partners, big, big husbands, wives. Yeah. You know, we uh, we're all very reliant upon you. <laughs> yep, yep. And we should be as well. Now, how do you relax when you do get chance to relax? Well, apart from watching, what Arsenal. do you do? What do yeah. you do? No, I said relax, Lee. <laughs> what do you do? No, that's true. It's been a few tough seasons and probably another tough one ahead of us. Uh, no, it's, I think like a lot of uh, like a lot of people in this industry, you build up a great network. Um, we're great social interactors. Um, I'm very fortunate that uh, I get to on most weekends to play a bit of golf, get to the gym, socialise with friends, see my family as often as I can. Um, and uh, and uh, you know, if I'm if I'm very uh, if I'm very focused, even pick up pick up the odd book every now and again. Um, what do you what do you read? What book? That's interesting now because uh, one of the things that one of the things that I try and do give me a little bit of uh, satisfaction at doing these podcasts is I try and come up with a title for a book or a biography of of each guest. Oh no no don't if, I'll if, do if, it I'll do it for you. Oh don't you'll worry. do it. oh that was great. But what um, was the last book that you, what was oh, oh, what what's a book that stands out for you? What what genre do you? Go for. If, if I'm being honest, um, and maybe a and maybe a bit of a failing, I've never really been a big reader. I and and as time's gone on, we read copious amounts of information, but we now we we don't necessarily leaf through yeah, yeah. something you'd pick up in a library. Everything's digitized and it's it's available in different form. Um, uh, but actually, if if there's one particular area that I do enjoy, and it's actually biographies. Yeah, um, and it's too. and and it's a little bit about what we're doing here. It's about understanding why people got to the positions they got to, and you understand that by reading biographies. Um, I read Branson's. I can't remember the title of it uh, now, but um, and he's had several written yeah, about him. Yeah, but yeah. but there was one actually about the creation of Virgin, you know, way back in the eighties. And of those days, you know, he was passionate about all sorts of things. He was doing hot air ballooning, and he was doing transatlantic, you know, jet boat racing. What, why did he get out of bed one morning and decide he wanted to set up an airline? You know, and the old adage is true. You know, you want to make a millionaire out of a billionaire, you tell him to invest in an airline. Yeah. And, 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 uh, but he did it in a way and inspired so many people, which I've subsequently come to met through the industry, that have gone as being yeah, yeah. A, a alumni of uh, a Virgin into very broad and variety of different roles. Um, and they all have one passionate statement, and that was they worked for a team that they knew that ultimately was being derived towards success. Yep. And it was not about the individual. Yes, Branson's a big name, and he's very well known, and he's got hundreds of different enterprises under under the Virgin uh, Capital brand. But every one of those has its own uh, focus. And it was very interesting just reading his story and seeing that, of course, you know, we all know Branson's background. He came from a very, very humble background, you know, actually didn't go to a great school, didn't really qualify in any great university, 
but he's now seen as one of the world's you know finest entrepreneurial entrepreneurial leaders. Yeah, and I like that story. You know, whether it's Sir Alex Ferguson's you know biography about how he turned around Man United, which was failing when he took it over. You know, whether it's Arsene Wenger's story. But he was also lucky. He was one game away from being sacked. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, and maybe we're all only one game away from And, from, and I'm, from I'm being sure he, he never, ever forgets. I can't remember the, 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 the he was a little fella. I can't, I, I, I'm sure he will never, ever forget that lad's birthday or Christmas or whatever who scored that goal because that's what kept him in his job. Yeah, uh, look, there's. But what a clever man! And that book is that book is a must read. Yeah, I think and uh, so it, so if there's a if there's something I take away in terms of things to do more, I suppose if I had more time to relax, it would be, you know, to 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 learn from other stories. Uh, everybody likes to hear about the success of others, um, and especially when they can find little hooks into it into their own industry or their own their own interests. I agree, and you're also a very successful dresser, as the little pink number. Would suggest. Oh, you never be afraid of a bit of pink. I oh, know. I think you're. That's that's <laughs> what you need now. So, Mister Pink, your reservoir dogs there. You you look smart. So the wife will be well pleased when well, she sees yeah. this as well. Better than orange. Yes. Yeah. 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 No. It looks good. It looks good. <laughs> now, covered a little bit of a book. Now, if I was to ask you, what's the music? What's the song that would make Lee Lawrence, no matter where he was, what company he did, up and start doing the dad dance? What would the song be? Oh. If there's a song that I cannot help sing to whenever I listen to it on the radio is Bohemian Rhapsody. Oh, you like that, yeah? Oh, absolutely. I was a huge Queen fan, you know, and I uh, I went through a stage in the 80s that apart from being, you know, a sucker for popular music as we all were in the 80s, you know, I uh, I was a big Queen fan, got fortunate, fortunate enough to see them at Wembley and... Um, and uh, and then obviously subsequently they've had great success. The film obviously uh, yeah, you see the was, film. was great, great film. Oh, huh? Yeah, yeah. I yep. saw the Elton John one actually the other night, which was Rocket Man. Which is yeah, and how does that compare? Uh, very different, and very different in that uh, Rocket Man is more uh, musical. Um, yeah. It's more yeah. of a of a fantasy uh, biopic where Bohemian Rhapsody obviously focused on yeah, yeah. you know the key character being and the Freddy. relationship and, yeah, and the relationship with yeah. his with his band and how they developed. But look, when you hear the story of how Bohemian Rhapsody came together. You know the you know the the, the seven minute you know record that nobody yeah, liked yeah, and that everybody and thought why. Uh, yeah exactly and uh, and that ultimately was always going to be considered as a, as a flop and how successful it ultimately became not once but four times is yeah. um, but yeah. no if I'm going to sing to anything in karaoke it's going to be that and probably along, along with a few others <laughs> so, well there you go brave man where's pink sings to Bohemian Rhapsody and supports Arsenal. Incredible hat trick, my friend. What a perfect, very challenging, yeah. what a perfect yeah. trilogy. Yeah. Now, Lee, we we had the chance to work together, and and uh, like I said, I, I really enjoyed it. I learned a lot from you. Um, we also had issues that were so important to us and both of us together, like like safety and security. Now, how do you feel? How do you feel those areas have got challenges at the moment? And what do you think? What do you think is going to cause a few more challenges in the industry? Uh, we sit here in the in in the Middle East, uh, Chris. Uh, we sit here in the in the heart of Saudi Arabia that uh, it, uh, will always have and has for many many years now had many uh, geopolitical challenges. Yeah. Uh, we can't ignore those on a daily basis. Um, so safety, security. Um, for our passengers, for our people, for our employees, is is absolutely the top of every agenda yep. um, that we have, and there's no reason why that should ever diminish. Um, and look, we 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 have a duty not only to be you know best in class in relation to our peer group, to be to be world class, because unfortunately the environment um, is increasingly requiring of that. Um, there are unfortunately too many people, whether it be digital security, physical security, yeah. um, that we uh, that are out to um, to destabilise. Um, uh, it's not always about necessarily big T terrorism. Uh, there are a lot of smaller uh, smaller things that we have to bear in mind. We only saw an incident this week where a very famous airline was fined quite considerably because of its data breaches um, yeah, yeah. and and some very significant information that was about its passengers and their booking yeah, habits indeed, and the nature yeah. of their credit cards was av- became available to others, you know, through a cyber attack. Yeah. So we are constantly under attack, unfortunately, and there are many, many parts of the world and parts of the economy that will see great pleasure and take personal gain of, uh, and, uh, in, in, in attacking organisations such as the ones that we work in. 
So unfortunately, it's not something that we can ever relax upon. Um, now, the good news is that I think we're getting better at it. I think we're getting more acute in terms of the responsibilities we have for safety and security. Uh, I think we're becoming more environmentally conscious. Uh, and I think in terms of the industry as a whole, it's starting to uh, flex its muscles and tighten up in relation to yeah, yeah. the corporate obligations that we have. Um, but having a corporate obligation is all very good. It, trying to get that down to what does it mean to the guy in the warehouse exactly. or the guy exactly. on the ramp or the guy managing the baggage handling uh, process or the customs officer or, or even you or me as a passenger moving through an airport, we all have a responsibility you know, in, when we were in that environment um, to look out for ourselves, our family and also you know, our fellow passengers. Um, and I think we're seeing this across the industry, but it, it's it, unfortunately our focus on it has to be unwavering. No, I agree, I agree. And, and, and one of the reasons for, for, for leading that question, Lee, is uh, the industry is going through a few troubled times at the moment. And um, when it does... Things like training seems to be knocked off or dropped off or not so focused upon, but also the type of training. And one of the things that I've noticed so much now over the last few years is the the types of the types of training are still classroom oriented, and and most of the people they don't want to be in a classroom for a long time. So as far as digitization and modernization, you know, we've got to start using apps and 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 things that make them really respond to the way they work now i mean i i've never seen people so focused on their phones as they are now and i yeah. think I, personally i think I it's agree. a shame i agree but but hey let's use that technology to if our that's advantage the point you know uh you know i am probably a victim of my uh, my smartphone my wife and my 16 year old son certainly are and and but actually it's also a brilliant way that we communicate yep. our, our day-to-day, you know, discussions and messages, and uh, and it's also a very cheap and a very convenient way of communicating with people. Yeah. So let's not. It's 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 now permanently, I'm afraid, part of our uh, our psychological uh, makeup. Um, and if you remember, Chris, when you were at school, probably about the same time I was at school, there wasn't even so much as a computer in the school, let alone on your desk. Oh, no, no. Yeah. And and now there's not there's a computer on every desk. There's a mobile phone on every desk. There's, you know, there's there's a technological means to communicate with people in a very very different form. Yep. And to be able to do that in multi language, and to be able to do that at different levels of interest as well. As we all know, people learn through different mediums. Some are more than happy to be talked to and to be shown physically, but some people like to read books, see pictures. Yeah, yeah. No, it's a balance. It's and, a balance. And, I, and I think we have to think um, a little bit more creatively in terms of our training tools, yep. especially as you know, and uh, we're, we're continually uh, surrounded by people that are used to working in different languages and that don't necessarily have a common language or a common necess- or a common way of being able to communicate amongst one another. Um uh, and I think the the people that are responsible for um, so, you know, the, the the training protocols, I think, have to address that. Um, yep. yep. No, there's a big big opening, big opportunity, and also um, also I think again another point is is the, the regardless what you call the generations that are there now and coming, patience. And I think social media makes people want things so quickly, and I think people now need to see that yes, you can have it quicker but you still need a balance of discipline and, and, and patience. And that's something that I always tell any of the younger guys who are coming up or younger, younger ladies, you know, don't, don't rush it too quickly. And once you get a good, good foundation, you've got so many opportunities and so many doors to peer through that you'll come across something that suits you even better than what you probably think you are. But, Patience. Yeah, no, I mean, you're right. Now, look, we're, we're in a world where uh, instant messaging means instant. You know, uh, long gone are the days when you could send an email or a letter and you, yeah. could, quite, you could quietly sit and wait for a reply that may be a, you know, a few days away. Nowadays, you instantly expect that somebody's going to respond to you this, the moment you sent the message. Yep. Um, uh, but that gives you, as the sender, uh, an obligation to think carefully about w- what your expectations are. And it's the same with training. You know, let's make sure that we give the tools to the people in the position that they feel that they can best utilize them. And, but we can use uh, social media and we can use the technology to help reinforce those messages. 
you know, and, and increasingly now as you walk through the warehouses and the logistics infrastructure of the world, the airports of the world, you see screens, you see messages, you see you see live reinforcement yeah, yeah, of, yeah. Of, of key messages. It's not just about sitting into a classroom, being taught something, and then hopefully the certificate they walk away with is going to be sufficient. Well. It's the continual reinforcement of that, especially, you know, in a live operational environment such as the ones that we've been talking about. Yeah, and competency assessed and competency based. Yeah, indeed. Look, people, you know, the world over, people don't get out of a bed of a morning and come to work to fail, right? They come to work because they want to be valued, they want to be loved in terms of what they do and, 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 and bringing the value of what they do in their job back to their family, back to their friends and obtaining that sort of social adulation of, and respect that they are growing as a person and growing in the economy that they work. So if you, can, if you can give them the tools to do their job and you can give them respect to do their job in a way that they feel that they can develop those values, then, uh, then uh, you know, people are less interested necessarily in the paycheck, more interested in what they're going to get out of it for, the, for their long-term development. Now, don't get me wrong, the environment of where they work and, this, and the, uh, the economic aspects still have to be right as well. As in employers, as we have been uh, in many different organisations, Chris, we have that social and moral obligation to make people feel valued and they give, we give them the tools to be successful. Yeah, no, I agree, and, and and we have to lead as well. But but I also I also think you know every car's got an accelerator and it's got a comfort zone, but it's also got a brake. And the balance between the two, you know, sometimes I, I I just feel people are rushing away so quick. Every everything everything you look you look at Uber and some of the companies that have been listed lately. I mean, they're not even making a penny, and everybody's bang 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 bang. You know, it's it, it's it's innovative and it's fantastic, but I think that balance, you know, and sometimes a, a little bit of the the older generation have to appreciate all the changes and the necessary changes, but we also have to give it a little bit of, uh, you know, a little bit of, uh, say, a little bit of the controls have to come back. I, I, I firmly agree with you, Chris. Um, and maybe uh, some of us that are, you know, heading towards the sort of the more latter part of our careers probably have to sort of recheck ourselves because, you know, if you look at the world's most valuable companies now, a lot of them are very virtual. Yep. Um, you know, Amazon over a trillion dollars of market capital yeah. Yeah. Um, or there or thereabouts. What an incredible story. You know, started off as a, book, in a bookseller in, yep. in, in, a, in a shed yep. uh, in some part of California, yep. um, uh, struggling to work out what to name a company. Wanted yep. to call it Amazon only because he wanted it A and first in, first in the picking of any search. Yep. Um, and, and here we are now with a, you know, a, a trillion dollar organization, um, Apple, Microsoft, Google, these entities would never have been considered. So who's wrong? Us that are traditionalists fighting infrastructure, trying to Im invest and lead companies that are still inherently tangible at their core yep. or the in intangible digital network that we're now completely reliant upon. Oh, and by the way, when I look at my... You know, I look at my 16-year-old son and my 14-year-old daughter. They are completely embraced in the digital world. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah, yeah. To the extent that I haven't seen them sit and watch a TV program now for years. Everything is on a tablet or it's an, it's, it's an instant form of getting their, uh, their entertainment and their education. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and for the time that I've spent in their schools, the schools and the educational practices are changing along with these technological advances. It is the future. And, and we have to work out how our business models yep. and the businesses that we lead are going to be adaptive to it. And also the fallout from that futuristic set of tools and principles. Because, again, I, 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 I definitely see so much competition just coming from social media itself. And some of the youngsters now, I mean, you, you, you look at all the levels of anxiety and depression and not able to cope with the competition of their colleagues or their cousins or their family members. Yep. There's going to be a there's going to be a little bit of a crossroads coming. So the the, the fine balance and the understanding, I think, is, is is definitely necessary. Yeah, I have a view on this though, Chris, and that is, um, you know, when there is an when there is um, social uh, anxiety in relation to some of the some of the issues that you raise, there is uh, a rush to bring in regulation. And, and we live and work in a highly regulated environment. Oh, yes, indeed. And, yeah, and, yeah. and we understand the, the purpose of that regulation. Yeah. It, is, it is to secure assets, to secure people, and the process of getting from people from A to B, or yeah. goods from A to B. Yeah. Um, and I absolutely understand that. Um, and there is a role for regulation um, within data management, and there's a role for regulation in terms of social media. But in the same respect, we also have to allow it to be 
somewhat self-fulfilling we have to allow some of the yeah, yeah. some of the uh the idiosyncrasies of social media to work itself out you know we've seen even in the relatively short recent time you know uh some very favorable mediums of uh, of uh, of social media have actually be, you know come and gone um and i think that will naturally be the case yep, yep. and unless the platforms themselves uh, look to address some of those concerns, they will be left high and dry. So they need to adapt. But I'm thinking our, from our point of view, we as progressive proponents of development of airports and aviation within this sector, we've got to address that this is a tool and a medium that is going to be used increasingly by our customers and by our clients and by our passengers and also by our employees. So let's not um, over-regulate ourselves in terms of the ability to utilize these tools. And, and, um, and let's be um, innovative. Let's be catalysts for change. Um, we've got the ability to do so. And if you, think about the small, you know, if you think about the small population of the world that we influence, it's actually a very, very, very significant position we, we, we hold uh, in terms of the propensity for people to want to travel and the goods and the logistics that we manage on their behalf. We touch virtually every part of yeah, society yeah, yeah, around yeah, the world. Yeah, yeah. No, Lee, Lee I, don't, don't get me wrong, I 100% agree. Yeah. I, and, I, and I think it's fantastic. Some of the things, I've seen some of the apps that have been, been uh, produced now and developed by some of the young lads in, in some of the businesses that I'm dealing with, and I'm absolutely bold. So it's incredible, mm. fantastic. And some of the things you can do straight away with customers, get immediate fever, it is absolutely fantastic. All I'm suggesting, and I definitely don't, don't agree with um, with with over regulation, and I, I still sit on IATA panels, and that's mm. one of the things I'm always saying. Sometimes it's too restrictive. However, I'm just talking about a balance and being aware of the speed that that, that you're going. And it's like anything; you, you people will love speed, and it's so exciting. Windows down, roof off, bang, <laughs> keep going. Look at what's happening. But the faster you're going, you have to be very very aware of some of the things that can happen. And how well you're able to handle those at that same speed. Yeah, absolutely. Which is why the competency assessed space and, and letting people always see how good they are and, and how good they are. And, and, and a basic question of, um, I did this the other day with, a, with a, a, young, a young Saudi, was asking about the, his perception of the quality of his company. And his answer was fantastic. And for such a young man, he was so, so mature in his approach. But it was still around the 60% mark. And he had good reason for that. Mm. So then one of the points I made to him was if he was on an aircraft and like or everybody and, and anybody that's listening now, I, 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 I beg of them to, to differ. They will sit on that aircraft when the crew are doing their safety instructions and they will still be on their phones and still be reading a paper or whatever, not mm. paying attention. Mm -hmm. But if the co-pilot said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd just like to say to you that for every 100 aircraft that take off today, only 60% will land there'd be an awful lot of people wide-eyed and getting off that aircraft. <laughs> and the quality levels that, that we expect as human beings in the criticality areas of our life is not necessarily the same way we, we approach ourselves with what we're giving. No, I agree. I and, agree. And, and look, look uh, we, we have a duty and a responsibility as well to ensure that... Um, you know, ninety nine point nine percent satisfaction rating is not isn't is is not considered to be acceptable enough. Exactly. Um, because people want to be able to get from A to B. They want to get their goods delivered on time, um, uh, and they want a hundred percent satisfaction that what we're doing for them is going to be flawless. Yep. Um, yep. And and uh, just like going in for an operation. Exactly. Exactly. I, I agree. So, but just now zooming off of that, as interesting as it is, and as and as challenging as 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 it is. Bucket list, Lee. Is there anything special that you'd love to do that you feel you haven't done yet? Anything that you've got on that list? Oh, there's, there's, uh, there's, there's. You've already done the pink bit, so that's clear. Well, my pink bit. There's uh, uh, to see Arsenal lift the Champions League yeah, well, uh, this, trophy. Okay. Um, Champions uh, League trophy. No, no. Yeah. To see England once again lift the Rugby World Cup. Which I'm hoping to, Ooh, which yes, I'm hoping we'll to do in Japan. Japan. Yeah, yep. I'm going to make my way to Japan. First Me time too. I've been to Japan, so that's on my bucket list as well. Yeah, I'm so, going. So, um, and uh, and look, uh, ultimately to make sure that I can spend as much quality time with my wife and my kids, because you know, as much as I do love what I do, it takes me away from home more than I'd like to, and um, and uh, it would be remiss of me not to put them high on my agenda. And that's a great way. That's a great way to. Uh, that's a great way to end. Okay, I'd like to thank you so much for coming on. Title of the book. Title of the book. 
I've put down Time for Others, Our Passionate Mr. Pink, The Man Can Talk. <laughs> Lee, always, seriously. Many really, thanks, Chris. It's been really, an absolute pleasure. I really appreciate it, and and you're you're one of the you're one of the the few men I've met who can adapt to any position, any situation, and you've always got something to say. And normally, it's relevant. Okay, okay so I'll leave you to work that one. But Arsenal's definitely got something in. <laughs> I appreciate that, Chris. Thank you very much for inviting really, me. Really, really, an absolute pleasure. I wish you great success, Lee, and um, I hope we keep in touch. Cheers. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye.